we'll be starting in just a couple of minutes because that's when the live stream will go live. But uh, we are trying to return to a sense of cafe church just now. So if you want to get something to eat, a tea or a coffee, uh, if you want to sit at a Oh, this one's on. I can use this one until the other one pops up. Um, welcome to Cafe Church. This is looking marginally closer to Cafe Church as we used to know it. We're not quite on uh, full-blown lunch yet, but we are on modest hospitality. So it's nice to welcome you. If this is your first time uh, at St. George's Tron, um, then you're very welcome. It's great to have you here with us. Um, and uh, I hope that you've, uh, well, I can see that some of you have already got yourself some tea and coffee and so on. Um, and please, um, if you don't want to get it just now, then you can get it again afterwards. But once we start the service, I prefer if there's not too much uh, going back and forward to the tables and so on. We used to just close the lunch buffet uh, and then reopen it again at the end. So we'll probably just do that. But welcome to you. If it's your first time with us, my name's Alistair Duncan. I'm the minister here at St. George's Tron. It's lovely to have you uh, with us as we uh, worship and, and celebrate together on this beautiful Sunday morning. You'll see from the tables in front of you, and there'll be tables near you if you're sitting at the tables further back, uh, that we're going to share in communion today. Um, if you know and love the Lord Jesus as your Savior and Lord, then we warmly welcome you and invite you to share in communion with us. Uh, if for any reason that's not appropriate for you, you're not in that place where that would be uh, you could uh, do that with integrity, then that's absolutely fine. Just leave that and just be part of what we're all doing at that time, even if you yourself uh, don't um, take, feel that you're able to take part. Um, 
Welcome to those of you joining us by live stream, and uh, if we're a little bit, um, if it's a little bit more, um, well, it shouldn't be too much more noisy actually today, but it's good to see a good number of folks here with us. Um, as far as masks are concerned, we're in this bizarre hybrid place where as long as you're kind of eating and drinking, uh, you can still have your mask off. Um, but once uh, that's finished, uh, if you put your mask back on, please. But we certainly want you, above all, to keep have a mask on when you're singing because that's when the aerosol flies in the air and so on. And Glasgow, like a lot of parts of Scotland, are still in extremely high case numbers. Uh, and so we do still need to be vigilant. As much as it might feel like a return, uh, we still have to be vigilant in terms of just protecting one another and being safe. Um, in terms of, of uh, giving, the offering box is there at the back, as is their uh, little Izettle. You can give contactlessly through that, or you can go to the Church of Scotland webpage, uh, the front page, bottom right, there's a link that you can nominate a congregation and give via the Church of Scotland, and that money is then sent on to us. And we do get it, and it does come, just in case you're wondering. Um, today, there'll be another talkback session on Zoom at five o'clock, so if you want to reflect further on any of the themes from the service, um, the passage, or anything, if you've got thoughts that didn't come up and you want to share them, then come along to TalkBack on Zoom, five o'clock today. I can give you the link if you don't already have it and would like to join in. That's no problem at all. Um, so, groups are beginning to start back up. Uh, the Encounter Group, uh, ladies group, is on on a Wednesday afternoon, and the Young Adults Group resumes this uh, Wednesday evening. Now, I think I was, might have got um, Anna to say a little bit about it. They're going to start in, over the month of September. The Young Adults Group is intended for kind of students and then post-graduating, so, you know, um, kind of roughly 20s age group without being too prescriptive about it. Um, so if that's you and you'd like to get involved in the Young Adults Group, um, Anna will be here. I can point you in her direction, but the subway shut down apparently, so I think they're having to walk. Um, so... But the Young Adults Group will start, as I say, Wednesday evening. Uh, I think it's seven o'clock. Help me out, Grace. It's half past, half past seven. At, and I think it's going to be a, a, a group in Anna's flat. So again, if you don't know where that is, Grace is a good point of contact. Stick your hand up, Grace. So if you want to know about the Young Adults Group, if you want to get involved in that, then have a word with Grace. Uh, she will help you or point you in Anna's direction. And the Young Professionals Group is on when, uh, as well. Laura, is that right? Yes, Young Professionals is back as well. Um, so Laura, who's getting a coffee at the back there, is the person to speak to about that. Um, is it a slightly different demographic? I don't know. Speak to Laura, whichever one you think are, uh, is, is appropriate for you. Um, if you think there isn't a group for you that would meet your needs of discipleship and, and uh, support and fellowship and so on through the week, and you're feeling disenfranchised, well, come and speak to me. Obviously, in the past 18 months, a lot of things ground to a halt, and we're now at the stage of listening and reflecting and considering what we, what we put on, what we do. Um, and, and so, if, if there's a need there, then we will listen carefully and see how that can be addressed. Uh, the midweek service on Wednesday is back in the building, so 1.15 to 1.45. I am recording it and uploading it. Uh, it took me longer to upload it on Wednesday than I thought because I had a busy afternoon, so apologies if you were uh, watching remotely and expecting to see that. Um, but uh, it will be up Wednesday as soon after the service is finished as I can get that. I'm aiming for by three o'clock. Um, other than that, I think that's everything that I need to say about those things. Um, we do have, however, a little, uh, was uh, Fiona still busy with them? Um, Ali, hello, it's nice to see you. Welcome back. Um, yeah, so let, let me just, we'll get to, Fiona's going to, you're going to, but you don't need to do it just now, we'll, we'll come to you in a little minute. Is that okay? Um, first of all, I'm going to introduce Torsten. Um, Torsten, do you want to come up and join me on the platform here? I'll give you the handheld. Thank you. And Good I'll morning. stand over here. So Torsten uh, is joining us from today uh, as our next uh, student training for the ministry. So we've had a whole series of uh, student ministers, as some of you will know, and Torsten joins us today for this academic year. So Torsten, tell us a little bit uh, about who you are and where you're from. So, yeah, great to be here. Thank you for welcoming me. Um, 
my name may give it a little bit away. I'm German originally. And the last 16 years, my wife and me lived in the Netherlands. And there we were part of the English Reformed Church in Amsterdam, which is part of the Church of Scotland. So I never put my foot on Scottish soil, I must admit, even I was a member of the church already for 16 years. And last year, my wife got an offer to come to Scotland to work here. And Scotland was never on our radar screen. It was the south of Italy, or the north of Italy, south of France. <laughs> well, such a sacrificial calling to us. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so we moved from Scotland. I left my job in the food industry behind and saw it as a big writing on the wall. Come on, train for ministry. And here you are. So what stage are you at in your training? Well, I just finished my first year, academic year, which was a strange one because I did not put my foot at the University of Glasgow, any building was fully online. I had my first placement at Houston Killel and Kirk, which also was three quarter online. And so I'm very happy now to be here and see three dimensional people. Yeah, well, there's some four dimensional people here as well, which is really exciting. Um, so good to have you with us. I know that we will hear more of you and get to know uh, a little bit about you as we go along. But welcome aboard to St. George's Tron. And, uh, we're learning as well as you. So we're relearning who we are and, and what life looks like. But uh, thank you for uh, being with us, and uh, we'll, 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 we'll get to know more as, as we go forward. Okay? Thank you. Thanks, Torsten. This is not just a day of welcoming, it's also a day of recognizing that as Torsten uh, comes here to, uh, to do his training or part of his training for ministry over the next academic year, um, Welcome back, Callum and Amy. We hope you had a lovely, uh, a lovely honeymoon. It's great to see you. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to uh, just invite Callum to come up because Torsten is about to is is joining us to train. Callum is uh, leaving us to train. Now, it's not that he won't be back. I know he's going to tell you that himself in a minute. But the reality is that for the next little while, while Torsten is here, Callum is going to be doing a placement of his own. So come and uh, grab a mic. We probably should sanitize these in between. There you go. Sweet. Yep. Uh, yes. So, yes. Hello, Callum. <laughs> Hello. Uh, welcome back. You have a good honeymoon? Uh, yes. Lovely timing. Uh, yes. Let, let's just say, uh, those of you who haven't seen them, congratulations to Callum yes, and Amy. Well, was it two weeks ago yesterday? Uh, Feels yeah, like it was. Something like that, yeah. You should know. Listen, yeah. listen, mate. <laughs> Word to the wise. Memorize your anniversary. Okay, it's, it's just easy. know it's when that is. 21, 8, 21. So it's, there's a lot of 21s, you know? Right. You, what you've just said there is I have no excuse for ever forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you had a good time. Where did yeah. you go on honeymoon? Uh, Harris and Lewis. So and we were just outside Tarbert in, Tar in Harris. So. Nice. So. And did the sun shine? It did. Uh, we got a sunny day on Luskintyre Beach and such like. Fantastic. It was very good, there is so. nothing better in the world yeah. than a sunny day on Luskintyre Beach. Mm, it is a glory to behold. Well done. That's great. Fantastic. And you are about to start your training. When does it start? Uh, well, I've been doing induction stuff for uni this week, but I officially start kind of uni stuff next week with courses and that sort of thing. Okay. And I think probably October, although that's not set in stone yet, but sometime in October is when I'll actually be on placement. So okay. So I'm a little we'll, bit later. But. Well, we'll hopefully see you around for a few weeks before yeah. you actually disappear. Yeah. Great. And where are you going to be doing your placement? Uh, Castle Milk, I think, is where that's... Oh. Again, still waiting on some con confirmation on paperwork, but yeah, that's okay. looking but, like Castle Milk. So. But that's the intention. Okay. So that'll be a very different kind of ministry, priority area. Uh, housing estate on the south side of Glasgow. Great. Well, exciting times ahead for you. Um, so, Callum, I just wanted on behalf of the congregation, Callum, as many of you will know, was responsible for doing our social media. We employed him a few hours a week to uh, put, you know, um, the posts up on, on uh, Instagram and Facebook and so on. So we're grateful to you for having done that, for running our website and so on. We're in a bit of a flux position. So if our website isn't entirely accurate at the moment, that's for the simple reason that he just got married and we haven't quite worked out what's happening next in terms of uh, social media. But uh, we, we want to thank you for doing that. But thank you for your role here as an elder. I know you're still going to be around, and I know that there'll be lumps of time between placements when you'll still be around. But I know from my own experience that when you 
move on from a congregation to start training, then uh, you, your, your, your horizons broaden and you look at other places and, and it's not quite the same. So uh, we are your sending church, or at least we're one of your sending churches. <laughs> Bears Den Kilimant, where you've worked for, what, nine years? Yeah. As a youth worker is, 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 is your other sending church. But um, I wanted to give you this. Um, you which uh, you can read and see what you yourself what it is, but it's just a little thank you from us as a congregation uh, for your ministry when you've preached and taken services for, and you'll be doing some more, don't worry, we'll get you back. <laughs> uh, we'll just want to monitor how your skill levels are improving. Um, but also for your service as an elder and a leader in the leadership team over the years. We're really grateful. I'd like to pray for you, so let's just pray together. Father, thank you so much for Callum and for uh, Callum and Amy. Thank you for their marriage and the beginning of a, of a new uh, life together and, and for the ways in which they're going to work out what it looks like for them to be in ministry as a team. But Lord, we pray for Callum as he embarks on his training. We pray, Lord, that you will equip him well. We pray that the theological study will be both stimulating and challenging and that you'll help him to work through the issues that arise in that. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you will build him up as a man of God and as a leader of your people. And we pray that you'll spare him no experience that, he's need, that he will need to be equipped for ministry. We pray for his placement at uh, Castle Milk, and we just want to pray, Lord, blessing upon him. Uh, that, Lord, you will just work through everything he's going to experience over these next years of training uh, that will equip him, Lord, for the place that you have in view already for him uh, to be a leader in your church. So hear us, Lord, as we pray, and as we give you thanks for Callum and for Amy, and ask rich blessings upon them both, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Callum. So, um, Fiona, I'm going to get you just, are you kind of free from contact tracing? Fiona's just going to say a little word. Um, the past two weeks, we have intended or wanted to do a, a, a wee tiny focus um, on, uh, on, on um, Tear Fund's response to the disasters in Afghanistan and, and Haiti. So I just asked Fiona if she would say a little word. Fiona has, up until uh, well, Tuesday of this week, been working for Tear Fund. But I'll let you say more about that, Fiona. Have you shown the video? Are you going to be showing the video? Yes, we've got one of the yeah. easy clips. Okay, yes. <clears throat> Uh, as Alistair said, I've uh, spent the past few months working for Tear Fund. I had worked for them previously and I've been on a, a temporary contract um, for them uh, this year to kind of help them out covering a, a secondment. And it's been a real privilege to be back in role. Um, for those that aren't aware of Tear Fund, they are a Christian relief and development agency and they seek to provide emergency relief uh, in situations of natural disasters, conflict, etc. Uh, and also ongoing sustainable development work. And they work around the world in about 50 different countries. As you'll see from the news at the moment, there is literally no shortage of needs uh, around the globe and two areas that are particularly a focus at the moment. And these are the areas we're going to be focusing on, I think in the month of September, Alistair can say more about how you can give, but we're encouraging you to think about uh, responding to these two emergencies if you're able to give financially over the month of September. And the two countries, no surprise, are Afghanistan and Haiti. There isn't an awful lot I can tell you um, about the situation in Afghanistan with regards to the work that Tear Fund are helping with there. Uh, for obvious reasons, we have to be quite careful about what we see. I can't tell you the names of any of the partners we work with um, in and around Afghanistan. But the situation there really is very, very difficult. There, as well as the scenes we've seen in the news at Kabul airport, we know that there's over half a million people who've been forced from their homes um, with the recent conflict. Afghanistan is currently going through one of the worst droughts in decades, and this even prior to the rise of, of um, what's been happening in the situation, food prices were, were rocketing in the country and people were being forced from rural areas into the cities. So food's running short, water's running short, and in common with the rest of the world, they are being stretched and hit hard by coronavirus. That's really taking up a lot of the resources in hospitals. Tear Fund's local partners in the area are concentrating on providing relief packages for those who've been displaced from their homes, those who've fled over borders or who are displaced um, within country. And these relief packages include food, uh, cooking equipment and hygiene kits. 
We're also looking through our partners to provide some form of trauma response um, for people that have witnessed terrible scenes as they've left their villages, left their homes. We, our partners are trying to ensure that there's some kind of ongoing support for people. And we are asking people to, to pray uh, for the situation. We're asking people to pray for the women in Afghanistan who are feeling very unsure and uncertain about their future. To pray for those who are trying to protect their families and provide for them at this time. And to pray for courage and safety for partner organisations working in and around the country. And to pray that help can get to all those who are the most vulnerable. To give you an idea of costs and things, we're suggesting that we know that £50 could provide an emergency food package, including flour, cooking oil, rice and beans for one family. So, and m for many of us, we may not be able to give £50, but as a church, as a congregation, um, what we could give could actually provide, you know, enough, enough food for many. The other situation is Haiti, and I think we are going to watch a short video about Haiti, um, just a short film clip that will give you kind of a scene from on the ground. But on Saturday the 14th of August, Haiti was hit with a 7.2 magnitude um, earthquake. It's left around 1,500 dead and around 7,000 injured, but th over 37,000 homes were destroyed. And adding to the trauma, Haiti, of course, had the big earthquake back in 2010, and many people had not recovered from that. So there's a lot of unrest in Haiti at the moment. If you follow the news at all, you'll know that in July, their president was assassinated. Gang violence is rife, and they reckon there's about 15,000 people are displaced in country at the moment through gang violence. It's not safe to go. And in fact, gang violence is... In, is um, affecting some of the rescue response to this earthquake because roads are not safe to travel on. Tear Fund's partners in country are focusing on cash transfers, giving people cash. Now, that maybe sounds like an unusual thing. Uh, normally you think, oh, well, surely it's best to just give people food, give people blankets. But actually, one of the things we know from working with refugees and displaced people and people in the aftermath of a disaster is if you give people their own cash, it actually helps them buy what their family needs because actually every family that has lost their home right now will have a different type of need. And rather than giving them just kind of stock packages, if we give them cash, it allows them to meet the needs of their family. So that's just a wee bit of uh, background to let you understand why Tier Fund would, would give cash transfers in situations like this. Again, the needs are for tents, for water, for food, etc. And we're asking you to pray for the leadership of Haiti, that they'll be able to respond effectively despite everything else that's going on. And pray for those who are the most vulnerable uh, at times like this, the children uh, and the women. And pray for the trauma response again too, because we, we learned this after the first earthquake, that this really, an earthquake is a terrifying thing to live through. And what many people reported after the one in 2010 is children in particular don't want to go into buildings anymore. They don't want to go sleep in a house. They don't want to go to school. They don't want to be in churches because the thought of being in a building when the foundations begin to shake and the roof comes down just terrifies people. So please pray for, for all those who are traumatized by what they've witnessed and what they've seen. And as I say, throughout the month of September, we'll be taking up offerings for it. I'll let Alistair speak to the specifics as to how we're going to do that. I know we're going to be able to get giving envelopes from Tier Fund. Um, yeah, we are, but I don't have them yet, unfortunately. And yeah, I'll let you watch the short film on Haiti if it's ready to go now. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. Let's just watch that little clip and then I'll say a little word about what, how we're, we're going to do this. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Antoine. I'm the country director for Tia Fund in Haiti. Today, uh, we are in Petit Tour de Nip. Um, which was the epicenter of the 7.2 magnitude earthquake which hit the southern peninsula of Haiti yesterday on the 14th of August. Um, early reports show that uh, the major damages in the regions of Sud uh, and Gundas and Nip. Uh, Tier Fund is working with our local partners to do rapid assessments and provide immediate emergency assistance to families who are affected. As you can see behind me, um, the earthquake has damaged and destroyed homes, um, buildings, schools, and we have loss of life, which already reports are over 700 deaths uh, and counting. Um, and so Tier Fund is here um, in the field responding uh, with our local partners to the needs of those who are most affected, and we ask that you keep us in your prayers 
um, and keep the families in your prayers uh, so that they can recover uh, and as we assist them in the days and weeks, months to come. Thank you. Okay, so um, simply what we, if, if you wish to, to make a response um, to either or both of those, then I think what we would ask, that for, for many of you, the easiest thing would simply be to go to tearfund.org, uh, and that will take you, and then you can look at, and uh, you can easily find in their news or their campaign section uh, links to the support that they're offering in Afghanistan and Haiti. There are lots of other campaigns on there as well, but we as a, as a leadership team wanted to focus on those two and thought that over the month of September, we'll just keep flagging it. You know, stories like, well, Afghanistan is not exactly fading from the news at the moment. Um, the stories in, from coming from Haiti have faded a little bit, but just imagine if everything that you knew had collapsed around about you, uh, two weeks would not make much difference in terms of rebuilding infrastructure. So those needs go on. Um, so really, I'm just uh, encouraging, inviting you. We will have, as Fiona said, tier fund envelopes. And if you prefer to give cash, we will make envelopes available over the Sundays in September. You can simply put something in, drop them in our offering box at the back on the table there, and we will ensure that those are passed on to tier fund. So really, it's over to you to respond in whatever way you're able to do. To do. Uh, and and uh, if, if it, the easiest way is to do it electronically by just going to their website, then that's great. We just encourage you to do that. Um, so uh, that's almost all, except Fiona, I'm going to bring you back down because, um, yeah, Fiona doesn't know about this one. <laughs> Come on, you have to get up out your seat. <laughs> so Fiona, uh, over the past 18 months, uh, voluntarily took on the role of COVID officer, uh, which was in many ways uh, a thankless task, although this is the point at which we say thank you. Um, Fiona's kind of stepped down from that role now, but for weeks and months, uh, Fiona was the keeping us right, uh, measuring literally. You see brown marks on the floor where the chairs are to go? Fiona put those on. After, she, after measuring to make sure that the chairs would be two meters apart and making sure that our contact tracing, Sandra's been a tremendous help too, but by Sandra's own admission, Fiona's done the lion's share. Um, so the contact tracing, making sure that, you know, we, we, we follow processes, that we clean down properly and safely. Fiona's been in charge of doing all of that. And at times it's been a thankless task because, you know, uh, Fiona's had to deal with pushback where people have been irritated by the government restrictions or by the Church of Scotland restrictions, and Fiona's worked really hard to hold the line, and it's not always been easy uh, for her. So just, this is just a little card to say thank you, Fiona. And... Uh, a few flowers to say thank you. And I really just want to say that despite the fact that I know at times it's been a thankless job, but we thank you for doing it and for doing it really well and for doing it really faithfully and thoroughly and keeping us safe and doing everything you could to make sure that we stayed as COVID free as we possibly could. So we do appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That's very, very kind and, and very unnecessary. But yeah, I would like to give a big shout out to Sandra and Paula, who were my right and left hand women in this and also did a power, power of work as well. But thank you to all of you actually for, you know, for doing it. I know we're hopefully reaching slightly easier days. It's wonderful to look out and see everyone sitting there. But yeah, we still need to remain safe. So if you see something you think, oh, we should clean that, then just let us know and let's all keep, keep pitching in, keep each other safe. But thank you so much for all the support you've given it. So thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Fiona. And we do still need help cleaning things and rearranging furniture at the end of the service. Uh, it often has just fallen to Fiona or Sandra and so on. So do you offer to lend a hand, speak to Fiona or Sandra at the end, because uh, we need to put the, the place back together again and, and clean things down. We are not out of the woods, you know that, because you're wearing masks. Uh, but nonetheless, as, as Fiona said, we're moving towards slightly easier days. Okay, that's a full half an hour of notices. <laughs> we don't usually have half an hour of notices, but uh, Anna, I've already said, 
said that the Young Adults Group will be restarting in yours and Goop's flat. But Anna, do you want to just wave? There's Anna over there. So speak to Grace or Anna. Helpfully, they're both wearing black and white stripes. So if you just look for anyone wearing black and white stripes. If you get Helen, then she'll tell you about the Encounter Group. She's also wearing black and white stripes. But uh, basically, those, those, that's the kind of team uniform for anyone who's a go-to person for a small group, it would seem. Ah, Laura is wearing black and white as well. Look at that. So young professionals, team colors, and they didn't even plan it. Great. Do you need a chair? Have you got one? No, you're all right. You're sorted. That's good. All right. Let's put all these things to one side. Sorry to weary you, especially if you're visiting, um, but uh, these are important things. So we're going to worship God together now. And again, let me just stress when you're singing, keep your mask on. But let's, can I invite you first of all to stand and we're going to say the words of Psalm 84 verses 1 to 4 together. And then we're going to go straight into worship after that. So Psalm 84, it's on the screens behind me. Let's say it together. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house, they are ever praising you. Amen.
please have a seat and let's pray. Lord, whether we come here together as friend or as stranger, whether we come here today as those who have been part of this fellowship for many seasons or those who are here for a first time today, Lord, what binds us together is our shared faith or our shared journey towards you. Lord, as we come into this place, we have much that we might look to as our boast or our achievements in life. But Lord, we know that all of these things are passing away because we came with nothing and with nothing we depart. And all that we have, we've received. We thank you, Lord, for all the ways in which through different people and different experiences and different journeys, Lord, you've met our needs because you are the creator and the sustainer and the provider. But Lord, we thank you and praise you and worship you as we come to you, Lord, as we recognize the ways in which we have so much to be thankful for. Even reflecting on the situations in other parts of the world, we realize how much we have to be grateful for. But with that provision comes responsibility. And Lord, we recognize that who we are and what we have is not just for us or for our own, but that we have been bought at a price. We've been redeemed by your blood, Lord Jesus, who gave your perfect life in exchange for our forgiveness, that by giving your life, by shedding your blood, by being broken on a cross which in obedience you went to willingly, we may come into the presence of the living God and know that our sins are covered and forgiven. And that as we submit and bow the knee to you, Lord Jesus, and as we receive you into our hearts by faith, so you transform us, you cleanse us, you renew us. And so we pray for ourselves and one another that you would forgive us, Lord, for all the ways in which we have sinned against you, strayed from you, and disobeyed you. And thank you, Lord, for the grace that time after time meets us with fresh mercies each morning. And we pray, Lord, that you will teach us through this time together today and on our ongoing discipleship how to walk well and faithfully and obediently with you. So, Lord, move upon and amongst us, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit, and stir and descend upon the hearts and the lives of your people, and call us anew, Lord, to who we are and who we are to be, that we might fulfill our calling in you, and that we might know, Lord, your Spirit's power pulsing in the very fibers of our being. For all these things we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, who taught us as disciples to pray together and say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to invite Torsten to come. His first job is to do the reading today. Hear the word of the Lord as it's recorded in the Gospel of Luke in the sixth chapter. On the Sabbath, Jesus was going through the cornfields, and his disciples began to pick some ears of corn, rub them in their hands, and eat the grain. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate it what is lawful only for priests to eat. And he, also gave some of his and he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching. 
and a man was there whose right hand was shivered. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with a shriveled hand, get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to him, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or destroy it? He looked around and then said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teacher of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they made do to Jesus. On those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, who he called the Silent, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Thanks be to God for his living world. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Torsten. We're following, uh, making our way through the book of, of uh, through Luke's gospel, and I'm going to keep it quite uh, short today, just partly because we're out of time and there's an awful lot in today's service. You know that already. Um, but this little focus in Luke chapter 6, and uh, I'm not sure if I'll get to the calling of the disciples or not. I just may just focus on the Sabbath stuff. Um, is a summary of, of the places that we've been in, in Luke's gospel already. Jesus forgave a man who was let down through the roof in a house where he was teaching. And everybody else saw the man's need as being freedom from physical paralysis. But Jesus recognized that in this man there was something deeper. And so Jesus pronounce forgiveness over this man because he knew that the most fundamental need for this man was to find God's forgiveness. And the Pharisees were outraged because only God can forgive sins. And yet Jesus spoke to somebody's need because he recognized what that need was. And yes, he needed healing, but the physical healing followed the forgiveness. And then Jesus was criticized by the Pharisees because he called Levi a tax collector and went to a banquet that Levi hosted for him with all sorts of other tax collectors because for the Pharisees, who you ate with, who you sat down with, and who you shared table fellowship with was a, was a big deal. And the Pharisees were, were outraged. And then the Pharisees pointed out to him that the fasting and the prayer that John's disciples did was a, was a proper holy response, and that the fasting and prayer that they did as Pharisees was a proper holy response, and they were outraged because Jesus and his disciples and other people that gathered with him ate and drank. It seems that at every turn, what Jesus did was basically to provoke the Pharisees who understood what God's law was all about. The Pharisees, let's uh, give them some credit, sought to be incredibly diligent and faithful and hardworking members of the religious community. They were fine, upstanding, upright individuals. They worked hard to fulfill all the laws and regulations. They discussed ways in which they could update those regulations for the times in which they live and make absolutely sure that nobody crossed the line. 
And part of the tension, I suppose, for us even just, you know, reflecting with, with Fiona there about the last 18 months has been the, the, the understanding for the regulations that we've had to live by, the tension between the times where regulations don't seem to make sense, and yet they're what we've been told we have to do. And we've all had to wrestle with uh, um, things that are inconsistent or things that make no sense, that if you're in a cafe, the virus isn't allowed to transmit to you, but if you're in certain other places, then you have to be hyper-careful, and so on. We've all had our share of cynicism about bizarre regulations that, 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 that apply in one place and don't apply in another place. The Pharisees would have had a field day during COVID, I can tell you. And that's not by any means to suggest that Fiona or anybody else is pharisaical by simply trying to do the right thing. But the Pharisees' understanding and the reason for being like that was because they thought that by working really hard to keep all of the rules and the regulations, they were pleasing God, except eventually it flipped. And it became something that was quite toxic. Being uh, conscientious and diligent, being responsible and hardworking, and seeking to do the right thing before God is, is important. That's what our discipleship's all about, right? But of course, what can all too readily and easily happen is that somewhere we cross an invisible line in our heads and our hearts. We cross an invisible line in our heads and our hearts that says, I'm doing quite well, actually. In fact, I would go so far as to say I'm doing better than him or her. In fact, I think I'm doing considerably better than him or her. In fact, he or she really ought to pull their socks up because they're not doing anywhere near as well as I am at keeping the rules and the regulations. And what starts off as an earnest, humble desire to honor God and do the right thing can very quickly in our twisted, fallen minds and natures become the point at which we point the finger. And we recognize that we've come up a few rungs on the ladder, which means there's people below us. And it's just part of our human nature, our dog-eat-dog, -dog, get to the top, survival of the fittest mentality that prides, and I use the word advisedly, itself in being that little bit better, more diligent, more conscientious, more sanctified than the next person. What was it that Jesus was doing in all of these stories but bringing grace to the helpless? Bringing grace to the people whose very bodies or life circumstances or employment, their situation in life was a glaring beacon for all to see that they were somewhere near the bottom of the pile. And especially in a Jewish world where there was a belief that if you were physically disabled or poor or in some way uh, down at the bottom of the heap, then God's hand had gone out against you and that you were somehow cursed. It was a kind of simple, medieval, primitive notion, but it made a difference. We have pecking orders, don't we, in our heads and hearts as we walk down the street. All sorts of pecking orders, who's up and who's down, who's in and who's out, who belongs and who doesn't. It's a dangerous place to get to, and we have to work hard in our own hearts, right? not to discriminate or not to uh, allow prejudice to influence us. I do, as, as many of you know, I'm, I'm involved in the training processes for ministers in the Church of Scotland, and I think I actually mentioned this a few weeks ago, but we get teaching regularly from, we have psychologist assessors who work alongside the church assessors, and the psychologist assessors are, are there mostly to inquire about applicants' background and stories and how their resilience is and, and how they've dealt with life trauma and things like that, and just to make sure that they are robust enough for the challenges and demands that ministry will throw at them. 
And uh, clearly we know that Torsten and Callum are both robust enough because they got through. <laughs> Either that or they're really good at covering stuff up, which is what placements are about. That's when it all comes tumbling out. But one of the things that we, when we get training from the psychologists, assessors, and every now and then they train all of the assessors in something called the halo effect. And the halo effect is where for various reasons that may be unconscious to you, something about a person's appearance, or, or maybe they have a name that, that is the same name as their, your favorite primary school teacher or something, or somebody that you're really close to in the family, or maybe their name is, is somebody that you hate. It's the same name as your wicked uncle. And so these unconscious biases can creep in where you start to look favorably or unfavorably on people because of certain things about them, where they're from, their accent, their appearance, anything like that. Well, the Pharisees were full of conscious biases, and they justified them. And the whole thrust of this passage of Jesus being Lord of the Sabbath, of Jesus healing a man with a shriveled hand, is that this, if you like, is a summary of, what, of the teaching of Jesus that has gone before it, where the Pharisees want to say, we're up and you're down, and where Jesus wants to say, you're down and I'm coming after you because I love you. You're down and I'm coming after you because the nature and the heart of God is to show compassion and mercy. I'm coming after you and I'm going to hang out with you and I'm going to declare God's forgiveness to you and I'm going to speak grace to you. Why? Because the heart of God is towards those who are most at need. And by rights, that's everybody. That The trouble is we can only receive the grace of God if we recognize that we need it. The tragedy of the Pharisees was that they thought they were all right. Thank you, Jesus. I've got this by myself. I'm actually managing quite well. Significantly better than some of you lot. What's that got to do with Sabbath? Sabbath, certainly for me, uh, you know, growing up, and probably for most kids, we weren't strict Sabbatarians in my family. But there was much more of a culture of what you couldn't do on a Sunday. And there are some parts, uh, some Christians who've grown up in, in particularly strong uh, Sabbatarian households or cultures, where the emphasis has been on what you can't, mustn't, shouldn't do. And what people will say if you get caught doing X, Y, or Z, or seen doing X, Y, and Z, and what will the neighbors think, and what will people say? And Sabbath keeping can oscillate somewhere between just a, 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 day, of, a day of enforced boredom, or a day where you have to walk on eggshells. Now, I'm saying that to a 21st century crowd in the city center of Glasgow, and I wonder what Sabbath means to you at all. Greg's is open. Shops are open. You can do everything today out there that you can do on any other day of the week, just about. The Pharisees looked at the lamentable acts that Jesus was committing on the Sabbath, where they were going through cornfields and the disciples were picking some ears of corn, which you were allowed to do according to Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 25. If you enter your neighbor's grain field, you may pick kernels with your hands, but you must not put a sickle to their standing grain. So you can have a few heads of wheat, just don't go cutting it and taking it home. But of course, the Pharisees saw this and said, oh, they're working, they're working, they're working. Ruth and I, when we first got married, we spent three months, we had a lengthy three-month honeymoon in Israel, and we stayed for a month with a couple in Jerusalem who kept the Sabbath, a Jewish couple. They were kind of modern Jews, but they still were quite, um, they were still quite kosher and quite observant. And uh, so we stayed with them for a month. It's too long a story to tell you how or why, but we did. We looked after their kids for a month. 
And one of the Sabbaths that we were there, they had, they had incredible devices. I know I love telling these stories because it still amazes me. But they had this setting on their gas cooker that was like the lowest possible. I mean, you might as well have put a candle under it. It was like the lowest possible peep of gas. And they would make a big pot of food which would sit on this peep of gas. And, and so they would cook it, get it ready, and it would, then they would set it on this gas ring just before Sabbath started. And the heat was just low enough and there was enough moisture in the food that it didn't completely dry out. So that they basically they would have warm food throughout Sabbath uh, that they could eat without then having to do any work because that was the important thing. Tragedy. One Sabbath day when we were there, somebody left the window open and the wind blew the gas out. <laughs> I kid you not, they came to us and said, um, is there any chance you could put the gas back on? Because you're Gentiles and we're not allowed to. <laughs> Even pushing a button to generate a spark to reignite the gas is work because there's a, there's a, a, a law that says you shall, not, you shall not kindle fire on the Sabbath. So a spark is kindling fire. And the lifts, the elevators have a Sabbath day setting which means that the lifts just go up and down and up and down. The doors aren't uh, they're probably quite dangerous, actually. I'm not quite sure how it works, but, but the lifts just go up and down. So you just get in, and it just goes up and down. Why? So you don't have to press a button, because when you press a button, you're kindling a tiny spark in the back of the switch, and you're creating fire on the Sabbath. Crazy, right? Well, the Pharisees were masters at all of that stuff. And all Jesus and his disciples were doing was enjoying God's provision with a few grains of wheat. They weren't harvesting a field. It wasn't back-breaking work. They were just having a snack. Why? Because God wants to feed you. And here was a man in the synagogue, a man who had a shriveled hand, a man who, ironically, had had nothing but Sabbaths his whole life because he couldn't work, or at least his work was impaired because he could only work with one hand and not two. And here was a man who'd been kept prisoner, and Jesus on the Sabbath day gave him rest from his affliction, gave him freedom from his suffering, released him from the shame and the criticism and the judgment of other people who looked at him and said, oh, God has found some disfavor in you and has judged your hand. And Jesus set him free. The Sabbath is intended, and the older I get, the more I'm reflecting on this, as God's gift to you, not his spoiling or curtailing of your pleasure, not his desire to clamp down, but actually the Sabbath is a day, and really it's up to you when or how you take it, because I think the principle is more important than the, the rule of the day. But it's a day where actually by stopping doing all the things that consume our time and effort and energy and attention, it's a way of saying to God and to yourself, I am your child, and the world will go on without me for a day. And I don't need to work every single day, because if I keep working every single day, then I'm effectively saying to myself that I'm really important. So what does it look like to take time what does it look like for you to believe that God loves you and frees you and blesses you enough that you can take a day where you can just remember that God is for you and not against you? That God doesn't want a ceaseless stream of work, but that actually He wants you also just to take time to be still. Eugene Peterson, the uh, theologian, the guy that translated the version that we know as the message, has written a number of books. One of them is called Five Smooth Stones for Pastoral Work. And it opens up his first chapter. He takes a, a salvo at busy pastors. And I'm guilty as charged. But he says, you know, I hate when I hear pastors saying, I'm busy. Because he says, well, what does it mean? What does that mean to be a busy pastor? It's an oxymoron. 
Because actually the ministry and the discipleship and the thing that we're all called to, right, is to be, is to be the children of God. Adam and Eve were created and given the, tree, the fruit of the tree of life to eat from, and they could have eaten from it. They didn't get to it before they got to the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil conferred on them not just the opportunity, but also the responsibility of discerning between good and evil. They took judgment into their own hands. They were cursed to have to decide what was good or evil, right or wrong. It's the curse we still carry. The invitation was to eat from a tree of provision and to live at the grace of God and the mercy of a God who provides your needs as Jesus was eating or as his disciples were eating those kernels of wheat. They were just receiving what God had provided. And you and I are invited to receive what God has provided. And as we come, as we shortly are about to, to communion, we do that spectacularly. We come to bread and wine and we receive that which we did nothing to put on the table. It's there provided for you. It's there as a sign of the grace that God holds out to you and says, this is what I am doing and have done for you, that my son gave his life so that you could be forgiven. The most important thing that you need to be right with God is not anything that you will do at work or at study or in the house or out in the world this coming week. The most important thing that needs done for you is what Jesus did for you and you could not do for yourself. Sabbath, then, is an invitation a bold invitation from Jesus who echoed his forebear David and was making a covert statement even to the Pharisees in that moment saying, I have the same authority and greater than that of David. And Jesus in the synagogue got the man to come out to the front and made no secret of what he was doing and he said, stand up in front of everyone and he healed him. Jesus makes no secret of having the authority to speak into your life. And so Sabbath is, also, is both an invitation, but it's also a commandment. A commandment to stop. Shabbat means stop. It just means stop. Whatever else you're doing, just stop. And let God remind you that it doesn't depend on the work of your hands or the fruit of your toil, but it depends on the grace of God, which is all ultimately that you will need. Let's pray together. Loving Lord, we thank you for this gift of Sabbath, but recognize, Lord, how poorly we keep it or observe it. In our busy world of lists and to-dos of uh, self-importance or activity. Your invitation to us is to receive, to be. Lord, we thank you that you have written into the rhythm of your creation the place and the need for rest, the place and the need to lay down, to be in your presence and to worship you, and to choose to remember consciously that you are the one from whose hand all our needs are met. Lord, you have made a way for us to be restored you are our shepherd. You lead us into green pastures and beside quiet streams in order that you might restore our souls. Yet too often we resist the gift in our frenzied busyness. 
Help us and teach us, we pray, to find in you better rhythms of being that honor you, obey you, and drink from you of the restoration that you have for your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in terms of communion, what we're going to do is just have the introductory words and so on, and there'll come a point where we will sing a little simple song in the middle. And at that point, uh, if you're uh, sitting in one of the seats around the sides, just go to the nearest glass table and take bread and wine, take it back to your seats. Those of you at that table, you've got bread and wine on the table in front of you. Uh, and then we will all take bread and wine together uh, once everybody's got. So as you come to his table, hear the words of Jesus who invites his people saying, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Who invites you, saying, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. And so we remember the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper recorded for us by Paul in his letter to the Corinthians, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And so, in the name of the Lord Jesus, and following his example, I take this bread and wine and all the bread and wine around this place to be set apart from all common uses for this holy use. As Jesus gave thanks and blessed the bread and wine, so we pray and ask God's blessing. Loving Father, your disciples rubbed kernels of wheat and ate the grain on the Sabbath day. And you protected and blessed their actions. Yes, done out of expediency, as were David's and his companions taking of the consecrated bread. And yet they had a need, and we have a need. A need to be fed, not just in our bodies, indeed not even in our bodies, but a need to be fed in our souls and in our spirits, a need to be fed and to re receive and submit in our bodies anew to bread and wine, which represents and reminds us of your broken body and your shed blood. Lord, come, we pray, and help us as we take bread and wine to recognize in them that we share in the body of Christ and the blood of Christ and so be reminded of the gift of Jesus for our sakes and for our forgiveness. In your name we pray. Amen. There are responses on the screen. We come not because we are strong, but because we are weak. We come not because any goodness of our own gives us a right to come, but because we need mercy and help. We come because we love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Come because he loves you and gave himself for you. And so we're going to sing that little song, which is a setting of words, some of the words of Psalm 51. And as we do that, uh, please get elements either from the table in front of you or the table near you and take them back to your seat. Hold them and then we will take them together in just a minute.
renew her right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew her right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. And renew her right spirit within me. Let's sing that again then as a prayer of preparation. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew her right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew her right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. And renew her right spirit within me. So we do this in obedience to the example and the commandment of the Lord Jesus, who on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us your peace. So take and eat. The body of Christ was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of him. Take and drink. The blood of Christ was shed for you. Eat that the sins of many might be forgiven. Drink from it all of you.
the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us pray. For the grace that finds us, where we humble ourselves before you, where we open our mouths like babes and receive what only you can feed us with, we bring our thanks. All that we might do, work to achieve or offer is as nothing before what you alone have done and must do. And so with thanksgiving, Lord, we welcome afresh these signs of your grace that meets us in our biggest need. And Lord, as you send us into this week and this world, we thank you for the promise that your Holy Spirit is in us and with us. We pray that you will help us to feed on your word and to let the rhythms of what you say to us and speak to us shape who we are and how we deal with others. Lord, we take a moment to think of the places that we will go this coming week and the people that we be with, whether returning to study, going to work, meeting with neighbors or family members or friends, engaging with different groups and assemblies of people. Lord, by your grace, may we be a sign of the risen Jesus, of truth, compassion, justice, peace, forgiveness. As we pray for one another, we pray, Lord, for the body of Christ throughout the world. We thank you for the reminder today that throughout the world, Tear Fund has Christian partners seeking on the ground in so many broken places to be a sign of grace and help, mercy and redemption, whether in the war-torn country of Afghanistan or in the earthquake-ravaged nation of Haiti or in countless other places, there are Christian brothers and sisters seeking to bear witness and to be a help in those places. We pray for their strengthening and protection. We pray for their courage, Lord, and the renewal of their own strength in times where they may be weary or discouraged or fearful. We pray for Tear Fund and with them all the other agencies that are seeking to bring much needed help both on the ground in Afghanistan and helping those who have been displaced and are now uh, facing the double trauma of what they've lived through and a world that they do not know or recognize. Lord, we recognize that many people all around us are living in, with, or through trauma. And so may we be a sign of peace and hope in amongst the people that you've set us. We pray for our own witness as a church and pray that you help us, Lord, to be responsive and nimble and to be listening to what you would have us do and be. So hear us and help us and give us your grace as you send us to the places that we go next. And all we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we're going to finish our service. We're a little bit longer than usual. Apologies for that. I hope you've not been delayed. We're going to sing in Christ alone. My hope is found. After we're finished today, if you want to get another tea or a coffee or sit and chat around the tables, we're extending the hospitality to the end of the service as well as the beginning. So we're not chasing you out as we've been doing in previous weeks. But let's stand and worship together through the words of this tremendous song. Of love and right.
peace in faith and faithfulness, and may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Spirit be yours this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. It was good to see you today. So, as you have a cup of tea and coffee and you possibly want to say congratulations to Calum and Amy, although they may have disappeared, uh, or welcome to Torsten, you might also like to say, and I forgot to say this earlier, congratulations to Dean and Charlotte. Last time they were here, I meant to announce their engagement, but I'm just doing it now. So... interrupting me to tell me what I was going to say anyway. And you might equally like just to kind of, you know, cuddle a few babies because they're popping left, right, and center. So, you know, Harrison's over there, Ayanna's at the back, you know, have a field day. With the parents' permission, that is. <laughs> All right, good to see you.